Today, I'm going to talk about some of my favorite short books, books that you can read in one day. A question I often get is, how do I read so many books every month? I don't really know how to answer that question because I never set a goal for the number of books I want to read. But then it always seems to work out an average of 10 books per month. Thinking about it, probably um, I think I managed to read as much as I do, mostly because I devote several hours to reading every day or most days anyway. But another reason for my reading profusion um, would probably be the fact that I combine big books with much shorter ones. I don't do that on purpose, it just seems to work out like that. I do like big books, but there is also something satisfying about reading a book in just one day. I love that feeling of accomplishment. Hey guys, welcome back to Bookish Islander. My name is Juan. I hope you are doing very well. Before I get into the short books I want to recommend, let me remind you that I subtitle my videos to make them more accessible. So if you want to make sure you don't miss out on anything I say, you can activate the subtitles by pressing the CC button. So today I have a great mix of books and genres for you. All the books I'm going to talk about have two things in common. Number one, they are all short, about 250 pages or less. And number two, they are all great reads. So let's get started. In other words, Jumpa Lahiri, translated from Italian by Anne Goldstein. A memoir of a writer who starts all over by learning a new language, Italian, and becoming a different writer. I recently read In Other Words. I started it one day mid-morning and I had finished it by the evening. Jhumpa Lahiri is an American writer who was born in London, England and grew up in Kingston, Rhode Island. Because of her parents are both from West Bengal in India, she grew up speaking Bengali at home and English outside. Lahiri became an acclaimed writer in English, mainly thanks to her 1992 short story collection Interpreter of Maladies and her 2003 novel The Namesake. After years of studying Italian and struggling to learn it, Lahiri moved to Rome in 2011 and she gradually became an Italian writer. She has now written several books in Italian, including, in other words, this memoir is all about how she finally learned Italian and how she began to write in her third language. I recommend, in other words, to anybody who loves writing and reading about writing and also to anyone interested in languages and learning. I read in other words in Italian and I could see a lot of myself and my own experiences uh, learning English and other languages in Lahiri's account of her discoveries. Lahiri uses different metaphors to try to convey what it is like to learn a new language as an adult. She also talks about the appealing loneliness of trying to express yourself in a language you don't yet know and will never know as much as your main one. And I can understand why Lahiri didn't want to translate this book into English herself. She talks about her reluctancy to even write in English after she moved to Italy. Unfortunately, I cannot comment on Anne Goldstein's translation because I read, in other words, in the original Italian. You know, I don't think I could recommend this book enough, so let's move on to the next. Silk, Alessandro Baricco, translated from Italian by Guido Waltman. While in America, Abraham Lincoln is the president during the Civil War, in a small village in France, a man decides to make the long journey to Japan to obtain silkworms. Silk is a gem of a short novel. It has fewer than 100 pages and the writing is so propellant that the only challenge is not to finish in one sitting. So, in the 1860s, a Frenchman called Hervé Jancourt travels from his small village in France to Japan to obtain silkworms. Barika's language is as luxurious as the silk produced by Jean Cour in this novel. Silk is a deceptively short novel. Despite its short length, Jean Cour's journeys to Japan and back are told with rich detail. Barika saves a lot of space by leaving the main characters perhaps a tad underdeveloped, but the reader can easily fill the gaps with his or her imagination. Although you can easily read Silk in one day, my advice would be to space it out and take at least two days to read it slowly. That's what I did. Brokeback Mountain, Annie Prue. 
Sheep Hurts, Jack Twist and Ennis Del Mar meet on Brokeback Mountain and soon start a sexual relationship that takes them both by surprise. Most people have heard of the 2005 movie adaptation of Brokeback Mountain by Ang Lee starring the late Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal, but the novella it inspired it is something else completely. I'll admit that I read it after watching the film, but I was surprised by how so much to the point the written text is. The prose in Brokeback Mountain is sparse and the descriptions of sex are blunt. This is exactly what I would have expected from a story involving two very manly men who have a sexual relationship in the American West. The setting is rural Wyoming. Brokeback Mountain captures the rough beauty of the landscape and of the characters. If you are only familiar with the movie, this story may surprise you. I know it did me. Brokeback Mountain was originally published in the New Yorker magazine in its 1997 October issue. If you would like to read it for free, there's a link to it in the description box for this video. The Metamorphosis, Franz Kafka. One morning, Gregor Samsa, a salesman, wakes up only to find out that overnight he has become a huge insect. How will he adjust to his new condition? The Metamorphosis is one of the best known works by Kafka. In it, we are confronted not only with an inexplicable transformation by the main, by the main character, but also we're confronted with how that transformation allows him to see everyone in his life differently. At first, Gregor Samsa's struggle is internal as he slowly comes to terms with his new physical form and tries to work out what consequences this will have. But then, when the people in his life come in contact with him, are horrified and even violent toward him, he also examines his relationships with them. Gradually, Gregor Samsa becomes more isolated and has to deal with deep loneliness and incomprehension from the very people who are supposed to love him unconditionally. This novella is ripe for different interpretations and is a great example of a short narrative that will stay with the reader for a long time. The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka is a 20th century masterpiece and an absolute must read. The Friend, Sifric Nunes, a meditation on loss, grief and friendship, and an exploration of art and literature. A woman struggles with the loss caused by her friend's suicide while taking care of the dog he left her. The Friend was one of the literary surprises of 2018 when it won the National Book Award for Fiction. Nunes' books have been published since the 1990s. She has written several novels, short stories, and a memoir of her late friend uh, Susan Sontag. But her writing only came onto my radar when her short novel The Friend was published. The unnamed narrator of The Friend is a writer, and this novel is also an insider's critique of the literary world. I turned to this book because it promises a meditation on grief, but what I enjoyed the most was the critique Nunes makes through her narrator of writers and her vivid descriptions of the contemporary American literary scene. Kitchen, Banana Yoshimoto. A rare look at the life of a young woman whose love for kitchens prompts her to take a job as a kitchen assistant in a cooking school. Kitchen is a novella about grief and love. Kitchen was published in the late 1980s in Japan, but it first came out in English in 1993, translated by Megan Bacchus. I came late to it because I only read it about 10 years ago. I'm far from being an expert on contemporary Japanese literature, but Kitchen is one of the better known examples of Japanese novels in the Western world, probably as well known as the novels by Haruki um, Murakami. So, Mikage Sakurai is the main character. She struggles with the grief caused by the death of her grandmother. This makes Mikage get close to her grandmother's friends, Yuichi and his mother, Eriko. Apart from dealing with grief and family, the novel also deals with gender conventions, for example, the character Eriko is trans, which was a lot more shocking in the 1980s than it would be now. A single man, Christopher Isherwood. After the sudden death of his life partner, an English professor must relearn what it means to be alive. This jewel of a novella gives us a day in the life of George Falconer, a man who has recently lost his partner, Jim. Throughout the day, George encounters different people. The year is 1962 and George is an Englishman living in California. 
Isherwood himself um, had become an American citizen in 1946. With the death of Jim, George not only struggles with bereavement, but also has to find a new connection with life. A gay man mourning his late husband sounds like something that happens every day, and I should know. But remember that this novella was published in 1964, many, many decades before same-sex marriage was legal in the United States and in other countries. A Single Life is one of the pioneering works of gay fiction, but more importantly, it is a moving, contained narrative of a character whose grief is not recognized by wider society. Okay, <laughs> I realize that a lot of these short books deal one way or another with grief, so I promise that the next book will not be about death. The Uncommon Reader, Alan Bennett. What if the Queen of England became obsessed with books? What would Elizabeth II make of the work of authors such as Jean Genet, Sylvia Plath, Charles Dickens, and Kazuo Ishiguro, among others? <laughs> One day, Queen Elizabeth II comes across a mobile library. Something moves her to borrow a book, and another, and then another. So the monarch becomes obsessed with books, and thanks to a palace kitchen porter, she even reads Marcel Proust and other gay authors. Just to be clear, this is a work of humor. Alan Bennett is a famous playwright in England, and his particular brand of humor is well known in Britain, mainly thanks to his work on television. His humor doesn't always work for me, but some of the jokes in The Uncommon Reader made me chuckle. I am not fascinated by royalty, and I don't tend to regard people like the Queen as real people, but more as symbolic and cultural constructs. But you know, this novella is not really about the Queen, it is about books, it's about reading, and that's why I recommend it. And I have got more recommendations for you, for you today. If you would like to discover great books in translation, click up here. And for some of the best books I read before joining BookTube, click down here. Oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you again very soon. Bye for now.